Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. We have a really fun program, and I'm thrilled to be hosting it um, for Dr. Tara A. Dudley. Um, I am Susan Langenick with the PRC. And But before we get started, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping to explain how the program will work tonight. Um, we, Dr. Dudley has an incredible presentation that she's going to present to us tonight. You, um, after her presentation, we will have time for a Q&A, I hope. I will moderate that. Um, your mics and videos are off, so we can't see or hear you, but you can communicate to us through the chat and the Q&A function. So if you have questions for uh, Dr. Dudley at the end of the presentation, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, well, put them in the Q&A, if you would. And that way, as we get close and wrapping up, I'll try to get to as many of those questions as we possibly can, as time allows. We do want to keep this to right at 7 o'clock um, when we wrap it up. Um, before we get started, I have a little bit of um, information about some other programs we have going on at the PRC. We have a jam-packed event schedule for spring, which I'm super excited about. Feels like we're finally coming out of our pandemic shell a little. And next week, we're about to start a Lunch and Learn series. It's free. Uh, it's going to be at noon on April 19th, April 26th, and April, I mean, May 4th. And it's called Vision to Reality. And each of those events will have panelists um, who will talk about what it takes to take um, you know, vacant buildings and transform them into vibrant commercial spaces. And so we have some really um, talented architects, designers, finance experts, and others who will give their knowledge on this process. I encourage you to look it up on our website, prcno.org. Um, backslash events, and you can see the whole um, lineup. Those are free programs. And so they are presented um, as a partnership between the PRC and the Commercial Real Estate Women or Crew Association. So it's, a, it's an exciting one. And then one more little promo on May 20th, we're super excited to bring back our Julia Jump Gala. It's gonna be black tie and very fancy. And it's going to be at the Four Seasons. Um, and many locals will know that the Four Seasons is in the former World Trade Center building. And that building is a mid-century modern building that was vacant for a few years and was threatened by demolition. And PRC advocated for its adaptive reuse. And so we're just beyond thrilled to be back and able to have our party in a place that was saved. Um, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. So look for those tickets on prcno.org. Um, and sign up. Okay, now let me get to introduce our claimed um, guest, um, Dr. Tara Dudley. This is not the first time that the PRC has had the privilege of hosting a presentation by Dr. Dudley. In 2018, we presented an exhibit of her research at the PRC's headquarters on Chapatula Street, and she wrote some companion articles for Preservation in Print magazine that year. Dr. Dudley is an assistant professor in the University of Texas at Austin School of Architecture, where she teaches interior design history and architectural history courses. Her scholarship examines the contributions of African-American builders and architects to the American built environment, focusing on the antebellum and reconstruction eras in the US South. Her approach to the study of cultural resources is interdisciplinary with a focus on 19th century American design, African-American architectural history, historic preservation, and material culture. She's the author of the new book, Building Antebellum New Orleans, Free People of Color and Their Influence, which was published by the University of Texas Press. It won the, American, the Association of American Publishers 2022 Prose Award in Architecture and Urban Planning. Congratulations. <laughs> Dr. Dudley, I'm happy to say, is a native of Louisiana. She's a daughter of Lafayette, <laughs> and she served as a senior architectural historian for Austin-based preservation consulting firm HHM and Associates, and continues to consult on preservation projects. And she is the current chair of the Texas State Board of Review, which is the advisory committee that advises the state historic preservation officer regarding national register nominations. Um, Dr. Dudley, oh, I should say, you, got, you earned your master's degree in historic preservation as well as your doctorate from the University of Texas at Austin and your bachelor's degree in art history from Princeton. So Dr. Dudley, um, welcome and thank you for being here. 
Thank you for having me back. I am thrilled to be in New Orleans, even if virtually. I'll have to rectify that very soon now that things have improved over the past couple of years because I'm itching to get into some archives and have some beignets, <laughs> so some real beignets, I should say. Uh, so um, I'm just thrilled to be able to, uh, to be with you all this evening and I uh, look forward to sharing my, my talk today, uh, which will focus more specifically on some of the women uh, that in the two families that I highlighted in building Antebellum New Orleans. And I'm excited to um, address any conversation or questions at the end of the talk. So uh, without further ado, let's go. And everything is okay on your end. You can see the screen and everything. You sound good on my end. If anyone is having a hard time hearing or anything, please let us know in the chat function. Wonderful, thank you. This 18th century collage painting, Free Woman of Color with Quadrian Daughter, depicts a well-dressed mulatto woman strolling along an unnamed street with her mixed race daughter. The viewer's attention is intentionally focused on the woman and drawn to her elaborate gown and headdress, indicators of not only her heritage, but also her status as a woman of means. But what of this setting? The pair traverses a cobblestone road in front of a grand Creole style home. Are they in a rural or urban setting? Does the home belong to them? Much has been made of the physical attributes of Fond de Couleur Libre and the so-called Tiron Law of 1786 made to identify New Orleans free women of color and keep them in their place within the mixed race caste of that city society. Free women of color responded by following the mandate through headdresses of elaborately folded fabrics, accessorized with feathers and jewels. These women's agency in the development of the city's built environment can be considered another form of cultural resistance and demands continued attention. The myth of the so-called tragic octoroon doomed to a life based on the whim of a white lover is a familiar trope that affects understanding of antebellum free women of color as well as Black womanhood and gender and race relations to the present day. In her 1837 book, Society in America, the British social theorist and writer Harriet Martineau's reflections on New Orleans included her observations of free women of color. She chose to focus on their perceived licentiousness and willingness to be kept, quote, in one of those pretty and peculiar houses, whole rows of which may be seen in the ramparts, end quote. Considered to be typical of such arrangements was free woman of color Eugenie Grosso, who resided in a cottage that her white lover, Jean-Baptiste Azaretto, donated to her at what is now 1308 Esplanade Avenue. The home was on the far right of this row of four cottages that builder Pierre Passebon constructed as investments. Less attention is given to the fact that Grosso's name appeared frequently in archival documents because of her participation in various real estate and money lending ventures with Azaretto and his business partner, Francisco Chetti. The trio owned two common wall townhouses on Frenchman Street in Faubourg Marigny that they rented as tenements. As such, recent scholars, such as the historians Emily Clark and Jennifer Spear, argue that the notion of plassage, interracial relationships under formal contractual arrangements, is a myth, an ahistorical application that simplifies relationships and families across the color line in Antebellum, New Orleans. Further, it ignores the agency of free women of color, specifically their roles in establishing and cultivating a relationship with the built environment as property owners, passing down not only cultural values as family matriarchs, but opportunities to possess and maintain economic enfranchisement in the Antebellum era. Today, my talk offers the opportunity to re-explore the foundation that some of New Orleans free women of color established through property ownership and development that became in some cases, the foundation for generational wealth. Decades before Harriet Martin came to New Orleans and the increased Americanization of the city influenced race relations and architecture, free women of color became the matriarchs of mixed race families during the Spanish colonial period. Among them were Louise Cheval and Genevieve Azamari, the matriarchs of the Sulio, Sulier and Bolio families, respectively. Louise Cheval was born around 1754. Her mother was an enslaved woman. Her father, Francois Cheval, 
was the descendant of Frenchmen from Normandy who settled in the German coast area above New Orleans in the late 18th century. While enslaved, Louison gave birth to two daughters, Henriette and Eulalie. Francois Cheval purchased his daughter from Francois Lyoteau in 1774 and emancipated her around 1777. Shortly after being granted her freedom, Louison began a long-term relationship with Frenchman Jean-Charles Rivon, the businessman or business partner of her father. Together, Louison and Charles had nine children over the next 25 years. As a free woman, Louison was able to enjoy the rights and privileges of property ownership. She acquired several lots in the French Quarter in 1781. Over the next two decades, Louison purchased several additional properties, pictured here. In 1802, she inherited a 15 foot wide lot in the 500 block of Burgundy Street from free woman of color, Marie Catherine Theodore Trier. Louison's oldest daughter, Eulalie, and Eulalie's children had a long lasting legacy with the city's built environment. Marie Leoteau freed 11 year old Eulalie in 1784, 10 years after she had manumitted her mother, Louison. The act of emancipation clearly spells out the legal rights, including the right to own property that Eulalie would have as a free woman of color, noting that as a free person, she would be able to quote, treat, contract, buy a fair sale in court, grant deeds and wills, end quote, and otherwise engage in the legal activities possible for the time. In the late 1880s, Eulalie began a long-term relationship with her grandfather's business partner, Jean Soulier. Over the next 20 years, they had 10 children. While the Soulier sons were influential builders, the brothers and their four sisters, Eulalie, Louise, Celeste, and Coralie, owned and managed a significant amount of property in New Orleans until well after the Civil War. Their mother's early property acquisitions set them up to be successful. Eulalie's first recorded property purchase was at present day 819 Bourbon Street in 1803, depicted by the large star here. It was located in the midst of her mother Louison's properties on that same street, which are depicted by the blue dots. Since Eulalie and her children lived on or near Louison's Dumas Street property in the early years of the 19th century, the Bourbon Street property was probably rented for income. Eulalie and Jean lived at the Bourbon Street address by 1811. His name appears in the city directory, but the property belonged to her. The couple also maintained separate residences and kept their business transactions independent as well. The Soulier children inherited their mother's Bourbon Street property. They sold the house and land, including an adjacent lot purchased by one of the sons Norbert in 1828. The proceeds from the sale went to the account of the oldest daughter, Eulalie Soulier, named after her mother, with the stipulation that she and her sisters be permitted to live rent-free in the house, only paying property taxes for one year following the sale. Eulalie's estate sale also included the four properties that she had inherited from Marie-Louise Liotto, the daughter of her former enslavers. These properties were also sold to provide for Eulalie and Jean's four daughters, three of whom were still of minor age. The Soulier sisters never married and were likely educated abroad. Family and other archival records indicate the sisters lived in Paris with their brothers by November, 1832. By the 1840s, the younger Soulier sisters, Louise, Celeste, and Coralie had come of age and begun to appear in notarized transactions. This table lists a number of properties that the sisters purchased and sold between 1840 and 1844, recording their ability to participate in real estate market for their own benefit. The Soulier sisters did not receive monetary bequests from their parents or have husbands to support them. Like their brothers, who were well-known builders, merchants, and developers, these women collectively owned land and buildings throughout the city, conducting business with New Orleanians of all races. The Soulier sisters utilized a number of the properties they owned as rentals to generate income. They did not distinguish between race, ethnicity, or gender in their rental activities. Examination of the family's ledger books from June 1843 through January 1845 reveals some of their rental properties. As absentee landladies and through the business of buying and selling property, 
the Soulier women gained a means by which to provide for themselves, establishing birthright via contractual agreements. Another female family member influenced the Soulier's children's relationship with the built environment as evidenced by interactions between Norbert Soulier and his aunt Constance Vivant. In 1818, their grandmother Louise Anchevall sold a Dumain Street property to her daughter Constance. In 1825, this property was sold to Marceline Batine. In 1829, Batine sold it back into the Soulier Cheval family by selling it to Norbert. Then in 1831, Norbert Soulier resold to his aunt Constance this property with a brand new four bay Creole cottage pictured here. Just a few months ago, uh, well, actually a couple of years ago now, at this point, the pandemic has erased many, many months in my head. Uh, this apartment, the upstairs apartment, uh, there's uh, two units now in the upper level of this cottage. Uh, and one of them was on sale in the summer of 2020, I believe, for $375,000. I'm not sure if the unit actually sold, but we could have had a piece of CBA history in our hands. Like Louise on Cheval, free woman of color Genevieve Azamare made decisions that supported her family's relationship with the built environment for generations. Relatively little is known of her background. Documents from her estate file reveal that she was a native of New Orleans and born around 1745. She's generally referred to as a Negresse Libre or free Negro woman in legal documents during her lifetime. It is not known when Genevieve was manumitted, but some historians agree that she was the daughter of Louis d'Azemar and an unidentified enslaved woman. Genevieve had three daughters early in the Spanish colonial period, Charlotte, Rosette, and Marie Francoise. Their father or fathers are unknown. Genevieve and Louis Dolio began a relationship and probably living together by 1779. They had four children, Jean-Louis, Madeleine, Pierre, and Joseph. On August 28, 1794, Genevieve purchased a lot fronting onto St. Philip Street from free woman of color, Mariana St. Jean. The acquisition allowed Genevieve to obtain and possess property in her name since she could, not, since she could only inherit movable property such as furniture and enslaved persons. This appears to have been completed solely by Genevieve without assistance from Louis, at least on paper. Genevieve, Louis, and their children lived here together after the acquisition. With this purchase, Genevieve set the stage for their children to establish a foothold as some of New Orleans' most distinguished Black Creole property owners and builders. Louis expanded the family holdings at this location. On July 11, 1801, he acquired a large lot adjacent to Genevieve's property that extended to Burgundy Street, pictured here in this overlay on the Sanborn map. In 1804, their son Jean-Louis added to the compound by purchasing a 120 foot long lot behind the property that his parents had previously acquired. Over the next four decades, the family made expansions to and divisions of the family land in the 900 block of St. Philip Street to accommodate the dolly old children as they grew older and established families of their own. The family compound also provided a canvas for Jean-Louis and Joseph to embark on their careers as builders. On St. Philip Street, Jean-Louis built several four bay Creole cottages in which he or his mother lived or rented out. These cottages are pictured here. Genevieve Dolio resided at present day 927 to 929. The original form of her the dwelling after she acquired the initial 30 by 60 foot lot in 1794 is unknown. Presumably, Louise and Genevieve moved there with their children, Jean-Louis being the oldest at age 15, and Louis built a house on the property. It is clear that Louis and Genevieve were both living in the property in 1801 when transactions for the adjacent lot, this ownership of the land is being credited to, credited to Louis and Genevieve at different times in 1801. But sometime after 1804 and without benefit of a formal notarized transaction or written title, Jean-Louis sold or gave the Riverside quarter of his Burgundy Street property here to his mother. When added to the existing property facing St. Philip Street, 
Genevieve then had a 30 by 90 foot lot facing St. Philip Street under her own ownership. Primary source documentation indicates that the family members did live in a house on this property. The extent house, however, features a higher roof profile and stylistic detailing of cottages that were built a little bit later in the 1820s and 1830s, however. It is a four bay brick between post cottage that features firewall extensions at the end gables, gabled roof with dormers and abat vents or extensions of the roof line over the bunkette or sidewalk. In 1838, two years after Genevieve died in 1836, an order to sell the property was made by the court of probate. By this time, the lot did contain the main dwelling, the Scorbay Cottage, and other outbuildings. Jean-Louis purchased the property from his mother's succession for $5,600 on May 11th, 1839, and then owned it for another five and a half years before selling it to Mathilde Durald in 1844. The house today maintains many of the original features, but the original louvre shutters have been replaced with batten sh shutters. Um, the cottage also has wide door lintels that are characteristic of Greek revival architecture or those stylistic influences by the city at this time. And federal style gabled roof dormers are present with period appropriate replacement windows. And you can see the curved muntins in the upper sash. The cottage is among the last buildings known to have been constructed by Jean-Louis or Joseph Doliol in the antebellum period. The Doliol women took advantage of opportunities in Faubourg Clomé, along with their brothers as well. In the latter half of the 1820s, the first generation Doliol daughters and sons invested in property of the former Collège de Lyon when the city of New Orleans auctioned off property after the school's failure. In 1826, daughter Madeleine Doliol purchased two properties at present day numbers 1201 and 1205. At her death, they were passed down to her daughter Victoire. In 1827, the Doliol's half-sister, Rosette, purchased property at present-day numbers 1223 and 1227. And here in this map or overlay of the um, Robinson Atlas, you can see all of these properties in red that various members of the Doliol family purchased. And so this would have been not very far from the family enclave that they had previously established on St. Philip in the, the Vieux Carré in the French Quarter. And they essentially were doing the same thing here above Rampart Street in Faubourg Clemet along the same street. After Madeleine Doliol married free man of color Noel Gallaud in 1798, the newlyweds resided at Genevieve St. Philip Street property. Louis Doliol had provided the funds for Jean-Louis to purchase the large 30 by 120 foot lot facing Burgundy Street in 1804 for the use of his two eldest children, Jean-Louis and Madeleine. Accordingly, Jean-Louis transferred the half closer to Burgundy Street to Madeleine's spouse later that same year. Ultimately, Jean-Louis transferred all interest in the Burgundy Street property to his sister for $250. Madeleine lived at present day 1010 Burgundy Street with her daughter. Her husband, Noel, had died in 1808 until they moved to the 1200 block of St. Philip Street in the 1820s. When Madeleine died in 1835, her daughter, Ricard, inherited this property and retained it for seven years. It was sold with the extent cottage and outbuildings, probably built by one of her uncles upon her death in 1842. In the latter half of the 1820s, we see, again, this property that the Dolio family, including the women of the family, had invested in in Faubert Clomé. Here, we're looking at um, the property that was developed after Dolio half-sister Rosette sold the undeveloped lot to her brother Joseph in 1834, allowing him to benefit professionally and financially. Joseph created two lots. On one, 1227, he built a two-bay cottage that he sold in 1854. And on the other, 1223 to 1225, he built a cottage that was sold after his death in 1869. In addition to property ownership, Marriage and educational were additional means by which free women of color created networks and fostered their male relatives' professions in the building trades. Eugenie Baudin's sponsorship of her son with free builders of colors was particularly beneficial for the Doliol family. She embarked on a relationship with builder Jean-Louis Doliol and bore him five children between 1818 and 1832. 
During this time, in July 1827, Rodin sponsored the training of her 16-year-old son, Emile Herrier, with the firm of Cherubin and Desource. Emile spent three years and four months learning the profession of carpenter cabinet maker. On April 9, 1836, Baudin married Jean-Louis Doliot, her longtime partner. By 1838, stepbrothers Louis de Saint Doliot, Jean-Louis' son from his first marriage, and Emile Herrier were working together when they signed a building contract to construct a brick one-story house for Roman Planus. Jean-Louis Doliot witnessed and signed the contract to vouch for his son's work. By 1840, the stepbrothers had formed a legally binding partnership. In 1840 and 1841, they contracted to teach young men of color the profession of carpentry building. One building contract from 1848 indicates that the stepbrothers constructed a double Creole cottage and outbuildings on St. Philip Street in Faubourg Femay for free woman of color, Marguerite Dauphin. The plans for that is pictured here. Either Drossin or Emile had learned the rudiments of architectural drawing for the contract included specifications with floor plans and elevations. This partnership lasted at least until 1851. The Dolio family then perpetuated familial involvement in the building trades in several ways, via paternal training and support, female, in this case, maternal sponsorship of education, as well as intermarriage. This type of passing down of the trades had far reaching consequences for the Dolio family. Young men in almost every generation since have pursued careers in building or construction related trades. This brief but multifaceted investigation highlighting two families shows that free black women's ownership of and engagement with property was largely self-motivated and served as their primary means of income. Real property owned by single black or mixed race mothers such as Yuleli and Genevieve often formed the foundation of the architectural legacies of families of color. The Doliol and Soulier matriarchs' participation in extramarital interracial relationships did not provide the foundation for the real estate activities of either family. It was the independent property purchases of Genevieve Azamar and Yuleli Mazange that resulted on the one hand in the creation of a family compound that was later expanded by the family in the case of the Doliols, and on the other hand, in the case of the Souliers, the creation of a nest egg for the children, particularly the female members of the family. Based on their own agency outside of their interracial relationships and despite the limitations legally placed on them as a result of those connections, the real estate acquisitions of Louison Chaval, Yuleli Soulier, and Genevieve Azamar, and scores of other free women of color in antebellum New Orleans lay the foundations that allowed several generations to be stakeholders in property ownership well after the Civil War. Thank you for joining me today in this very brief overview of some of my research. I encourage you to, uh, to purchase the book if you have not, which goes very much in depth uh, to both of these families, as well as other free, color, um, free builders of color um, and their families. And I'm welcome to any and all questions at this time. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, that was fascinating. And it reminds me of the exhibit. A bit of that research was part of an exhibit back in 2018 um, at the PRC. And one of the things that I took away from that exhibit back then, and also what your presentation here tonight was the Solier family, did many of them leave before Civil War? They moved back to France and didn't come back. Is that yes, correct? That's correct. So um, one of the brothers, uh, Norbert Soudier, who, who I talked about um, specifically in this talk, he built the house for his aunt Constance. Uh, he was probably one of the more uh, formally educated as far as architecture is concerned, members of the family. Uh, research reveals that he had an apprenticeship perhaps, but definitely a working relationship with um, Benjamin Latrobe, uh, the younger, um, or. Benjamin Latrobe's son, I'm sorry, uh, Henry Bonneval Sellen Latrobe. And he um, was involved in the construction of the, the Louisiana sugar refinery for Edmund Forstall with his cousin, Edmund Griot, the brother of the famed um, engineer, Nobel Griot. And so uh, something happened uh, 
history hasn't quite revealed what that was, but uh, both of the, the cousins, the two cousins, um, left that project and then both went abroad for some time. Norbert came back and then basically began making preparations to move for good. And he was the first of the brothers to leave New Orleans for, for Paris. Uh, a couple of the other brothers followed Lucien um, Alban. Bernard was the brother who stayed in New Orleans the longest until the 1870s, until which time he left, uh, but the Soudier sisters left earlier with their brothers uh, in the 1830s, uh, while Bernard uh, essentially held down the fort here and uh, took care of the family's business affairs. Uh, but I did also find in my research, uh, reading the marriage contract of Bernard Soudier and his cousin, that um, essentially the family had, and this was in the, uh, I know I can't remember the year, but when they got married, they basically, you know, in dividing up saying what belonged to, um, to her uh, and what belonged to him, that they were going to at some point leave for Paris. So essentially it had been the attempt of the Soudiers uh, to leave. Their mother had, um, had passed away uh, fairly early on and their father, father passed away as well. And they had determined to go back to their father's um, country of birth. And so they, they did leave New Orleans and um, on the other hand, there are members of the, the CBA family that are still in New Orleans. I saw a question to that effect here in the chat. And um, the, the descendants are actually not from Louis and Genevieve because that, that line died out. Louis had a brother who um, also had an interracial relationship and it is their descendants. Uh, they had several sons um, and their, their children and, and progeny uh, are the branch of the Dolio family that are still residents of New Orleans. The director of the New Orleans airport is a Dolia. Yes. So there's still quite a few Dolias around. Mm -hmm. um, I know you may not be able to know this from the historical archive, but it sort of begs the question that the free people of color had rights that they would lose after the Civil War, mm -hmm. I would imagine. Um, did they? I mean, they had property rights prior to the Civil War, unlike in other um, Confederate states. And so it just sort of begs the question, the Soliers sort of read the tea leaves and decide that their, their, their fortune could be better held in France than in, the, in Louisiana? Yeah, in many ways, I think they did. Uh, it, it, because it seems they had, um, you know, put these plans in place with all of the rental properties and, and speculative properties they had and creating a nest egg for the different members of the family. And um, it appears that Bernard did try to, to kind of hold out for as long as he could. Uh, he was involved in um, various civic activities and trying to help the free people of color community and then Blacks, um, African Americans after the Civil War um, hold on to many of those rights. Uh, but I think then at that point, um, he decided enough was enough and went to join the rest of his family. I just find it fascinating because Louisiana was different than a lot yeah. of other places in the South. And so Absolutely. you just wonder what these families were thinking. Yeah, you know, and of course, had... property ownership was um, one of the ways that families could, uh, you know, acquire a significant amount of wealth. Um, but it's very interesting uh, because thinking about, you know, some of the comparisons that I make in the book with other, with white Creole builders um, and property owners, as well as Americans who were coming into the city um, and others, they are um, approaching contributions to the building trades and the built environment and, and architecture with a capital A um, in a very different way, uh, not really seeking. And you know, this is intentional, some of the larger contracts because there's a certain amount of risk um, involved in you know, going for big contracts uh, this time period. Not the, you know, of course, their race, um, their ethnicity played a significant portion of um, some of the things that they were locked out of in the city. But many of these individuals and families had a significant network um, of connections of, between many different people. I mean, being educated by Latrobe, for example, having uh, relationships and, and acquiring property from former enslavers even, as well as white family members um, when they were recognized. 
and um, being able to acquire wealth that way. And then many of these individuals also diversified. And so you have um, Bernard and Aldo and Soudier who not only were builders, but they were also commission merchants. You have stories of, um, you know, Francois Lacroix, for example, who was a, a tailor in addition to owning property and, um, and other things. And so in many ways, we see free people of color in New Orleans who are taking advantage of the opportunity that property ownership um, and, and being able to, to build uh, offer them in the city, but really um, approaching this in a, in a very different way uh, that allowed them to be successful and in many ways remain successful and retain um, control of property um, and to a certain extent, um, you know, legal rights in the city potentially for, for longer than they might have otherwise. Did they lose those property rights after the Civil War? The property rights weren't lost necessarily, but many families sold their property as they moved to neighborhoods that were more welcoming to Blacks um, in the uh, in the postbellum era and uh, you know, for various reasons did not retain those properties. And then of course you have um, overt and covert ways in which individuals were um, discouraged uh, or prohibited from acquiring property. That was one of the questions um, Cynthia Mann had asked, how were the free women of color treated in white society during this time period? Were they considered developers or were they considered sort of, a, how were they treated? Um, well, this is one of the reasons why, in, in many ways, I'm, you know, I'm shifting a little bit in um, my research to focus on some of those women, um, because, you know, I, I open the talk with, you know, many of these myths that that we're all familiar with, and the place of free women of color, um, and the reasons that they might have embarked on interracial relationships, um, the rights that uh, they did have legally or not, um, and some of the perceived rights that they have. And I just, I, there's so many things that if I could, I would like to ask <laughs> these women, of course. But um, property ownership was definitely a way for them to maintain their own agency outside of interracial relationships, other family relationships, uh, race aside uh, in, in this time period. And so you see significant numbers of free women of color who um, are acquiring property in, in various ways in order to support themselves, to support them children, their children, and in some ways uh, create wealth for themselves um, in generations to come when that was possible. Uh, Beatrice Souvelle, I hope I didn't just butcher your name, um, has a related question to that, asking if the descendants of some of these families were able to, to benefit financially into the modern times. I mean, I know you've traced some of these chains of title through many generations of these families. The Dolios who are still here are not direct descendants of the family that you, I mean, they're cousins, I suppose, of yes. the family. Um, were any of them able to, to, were you able to see that financial benefit carry on through even to the, no. Based on my research, uh, most of those properties were sold out of the family, the Soulier family as well. And so they ultimately um, sold all of their properties. Does your book provide information regarding the origin of other homes built in the Treme? Or is it mainly Maroney French Quarter? Yes, there are several other homes um, built by the, the Dolios and CBAs, as well as other builders of color uh, and, and just antebellum builders that I do talk about in the book. Do you know a rough estimate of what it would be worth today, what their holdings might have been in each of these families? Oh, that's a good question and one that I should, I should calculate. I mean, it would be extensive. There's, um, when I present a, the broader talk in, in their maps in the, um, in the book that show the locations of the families. And of course, um, you know, when I, when I first came to this research and you know, was expecting to find property ownership, maybe only in Faubourg Clemay or only in the Marigny, because of course those are the neighborhoods that are more closely associated with free people of color in the antebellum era. And I was surprised to see how many properties they owned in, um, in the French Quarter, as well as in the, the burgeoning uh, garden district um, and, and other areas of the city at this time. And uh, between the two families, and especially the Souliers, who were much more um, 
speculative developers during uh, the antebellum era. They owned a lot of property. Um, and it was it was quite amazing when um, you know making that uh, discovery. I remember from your articles from Preservation in Print, you talked about how while they were developers, and then so the narrative that at least I grew up in New Orleans hearing was about free people of color being um, professional craftspeople, mm -hmm. bricklayers, plasters, masons, um, and were incredibly talented, and many of them carried those trades on into future centuries. Mm -hmm. I never grew up hearing that they were real estate developers, which I think is an interesting thing that was missing. Yes. But you made the point in some of your research in the Preservation of Print articles is that they would build these houses, some of them spec houses, but they would be using the craftspeople from their community. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was an entire economic system, wasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Um, and really, you know, a lot of these connections, whether they were familial or communal, really ran deep. And you see this not only in their relationships as far as, you know, building, but even, um, you know, the development of, of schools and other civic institutions and educational institutions um, owning, you know, just the significant amounts of properties that they owned on mass next to one another, um, having relationships in church, being um, witnesses on legal documents, whether they're inventories or wills, um, you know, godparents for one another's children, and, uh, you know, witnesses to marriage ceremonies, and so on and so forth, on and on and on, and you see these different connect connections, it's, it's quite awesome, um, really, the, the depth to which they developed and created these networks to help, um, you know, not only establish their identity in the city, but maintain that identity. Uh, especially in this time period where New Orleans is changing so rapidly um, in its becoming an American city during this time. Someone, um, Phyllis, posted that she owns an 1823 Creole cottage in Bywater and knows who was the owner who paid to have it built, but doesn't know the, the builder. Is there a way to research that? I mean, Imperial Archive in New Orleans is an incredible source. Would you talk a little bit about how you did this research? Yes, um, and so at, at first, I'm, so I'm from Lafayette, um, and then I, I was taking a class in graduate school called Architecture in the Age of Revolution. And when it came time to research a paper, um, I, you know, I thought, oh, you know, I'll, I'll see if there's any contributions, you know, based on the Haitian revolutions to architecture in Louisiana. Well, I had never really learned any of this in school, and lo and behold, of course, there was. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the preeminent resources um, has been and still is the New Orleans architecture series. And so, um, you know, I, I wrote my term paper, which was really an overview, a summary of a lot of this information. And then uh, when it came time to write the dissertation and, uh, you know, a, a selected dissertation topic, uh, there was so much more that I wanted to learn. And the way that I started was going through those, those books, those New Orleans architecture series books, and I created a spreadsheet, which is kind of ridiculously large, of every mention of a free person of color as a builder, as a property owner. And I started generating the list that way. And then in having to narrow down such a huge subject, um, decided to focus on the Dolioles and the CVAs because for me, you know, and this was before I had learned, you know, a whole lot about either family in depth or the the legacy, legacies of those families. Um, you know, to me, they they sort of served served as perfect foils because I did know that one family essentially was still there, one was not, uh, and developed the research and and the dissertation that way in the book. Uh, but the, the notorial archives, and so going through then all the properties that were the Dolios and the CVAs now. Um, from my research and then continuing from properties that were mentioned in sales and transactions there. Um, the Vieux Carré survey was another tremendous resource, which was also digitized during the time that I was writing my dissertation. And so that was tremendous because I could be here in Texas continuing to do research specifically on those properties um, and so in a very specific way, looking for those names and those properties and trying to, to trace um, that way and thinking about also, again, relationships with neighbors uh, and so on and so forth. Um, a good bit of the information specifically on the women that I shared in the family is not in the book, 
because continued research that I've, I've engaged in um, has, has highlighted that. Um, and so the relationship, for example, that Ulele had with, and, and Louison had with their former enslavers was not documentation that I discovered until after the dissertation and literally just after it's like, okay, the ink's dry, this is going to print on the book. It's just like, oh no, and there's more information. So there are more stories to tell. And of course, focusing only on these two families, there are a number of families that I could have engaged in a very similar process with or, or individuals even. Um, so there could almost be you know, a series on different builders or different families um, as part of the work. So uh, very extensive and um, sort of, it's not, you know, it's knowing what the resources are because the, the process or trajectory maybe isn't exactly the same every time, but it's like when you find this clue and then it kind of informs you which document you should go and look for. So, so maybe I need to go and look for this probate record or see, you know, this in a city directory, this is where they live, they're located or they rented out and so on and so forth. Uh, but New Orleans uh, in Louisiana, history and archives are great uh, because they offer that kind of um, opportunity. Um, and specifically to that question, however, um, there are very few building contracts actually for mm -hmm. these properties uh, because of the nature of the communication in the Jean de Colonie community. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of this work was done by word of mouth. Oh, cousin so-and-so or Mr. Dolio can build you a house. Um, you know, and, and, and they're actually, when you do have contracts, some of them specifically say with a porch like so-and-so's house or a four bay cottage like XYZ. And then of course, if you have this by word of mouth, I mean, Mr. Subi, I need you to build me a two bay Creole cottage like, you know, my neighbors down the street kind of thing. Um, and so actual contracts with builders names um, are few and far between, unfortunately. But again, there are other ways that you can make those uh, make some connections. Oh, that is fascinating because, New, you know, the New Orleans Notorial Archives are such an incredible resource um, that a lot of states don't have, oh, a lot yes. of cities don't have. And so we're very lucky that the, you know, the custom was to notarize everything. And that's mm -hmm. why we have all these documents. But it's interesting that there weren't a lot of building contracts. And I can imagine it was a lot of handshake deals. Like, exactly. oh, my cousin's going to build you a house down the street, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> that very thing. Um, there's a question about the, the property that's on the cover of your book. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? Where is yes. it? Yes. So that is the Louisiana Sugar Refinery. That is the project that Nobert and his cousin Edmund were working on uh, when something hit the fan and happened. Uh, we don't know if there was a conflict between um, Edmund's father, who was uh, Vincent Rieu, um, white man who had a relationship with um, Constance's sister. And so they, um, Constance and Yuleli's sister. And so we're not quite sure what happened, uh, some disagreement, but it, it trickled down onto the sons and they did not complete the project. Uh, it was uh, completed by Henry Howard uh, mm -hmm. sometime later. But um, originally, it was Soudier and Ryu who worked on this particular property. And here we see a photograph from um, 1876, I believe. That's incredible. So mm -hmm. Henry Howard, yes. who gets so much acclaim, uh -huh. was actually finishing a project that was designed by a free person of color builder. And finished you know, they didn't call them architects back then, but yes. they were architects. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is one of the concluding sort of remarks that I make in the book. You know, you think about architecture with a capital A. I mean, but these men were architects for all intents and purposes. Like they engaged in contracts, even though we don't have them written down. Um, you know, they had people working for them, uh, enslaved and free. And um, you know they had the same system, but because they were black, because they were building vernacular architecture, um, again in a time where you have the the profession of architecture really coming into its own in um, in the United States, and of course with um, you know your your big name white architects coming from the Eastern Seaboard and doing work in the city in the antebellum era and really changing the dynamic of the building trades during this time. Um, you know, they, they, they really aren't giving the, the credit that they're due as, um, as contributors to the built environment. 
that's why your research is so enlightening, I think, because I think it tells a full, fuller story of who really built New Orleans. You know, it wasn't just the name, the marquee names that we hear. Um, there were many others who were involved and the city of New Orleans would not look like it does today. Yeah, I was, uh, you took the words right out of my mouth, Susan. I mean, if we didn't have these builders and, you know, the roles of Creole cottages, which really were a hallmark of free people of color builders, specifically those who were born in New Orleans. Um, so native born, you know, a lot of times when we talk about um, our Creole architecture, there is a focus on emigres who are coming as a result of the Haitian Revolution um, and whatnot, we talk a lot about the development of the shotgun house um, by virtue of this, you know, creolization we call it of um, architecture and these different influences. Uh, but really, these native-born builders, these native sons, had a very important role in the development of the city, the maintenance of the city. I mean, these were the men who were joining the Louisiana Native Guards or attempting to, in order to maintain. Um, you know, the, the historic city uh, and, and that environment, that atmosphere and the, um, the contribution, not only of, of, um, of, of Jean de Couleur d'Ivoire, but just the Creole community in general, um, again, in the face of all of these outside influences that are coming in, um, Americans, the increase in uh, European immigration, even uh, in the city during this time period. So their, um, their work is, is really important. And I've seen several comments. I'm going to jump in here from Xavier Farmer Coleman. Hey there, who is the owner of uh, Soulier Cottage? And um, she's put the link here. Um, so definitely check it out. Um, she did some amazing work on the renovations of one of the four bay Creole cottages that the Soulier family built and owned in, um, in the city. And uh, also to speak to one of her questions that I saw, she asked about. Um, enslaved builders and the family members um, being enslavers. Yes, they were. Um, again, some of my continuing research, um, neither of the families owned um, enslaved people in significant numbers to say you know, that they were really contributing to their, their architecture and, and their building practices. But um, you know, certainly there are any older men of age might have been individuals who were uh, contributing to construction on some of those sites. Um, the, the numbers and the ages of the of enslaved persons um, that were owned by either family um, lead me to believe that most would have been um, domestic servants or um, family members potentially that they were purchasing to then manumit at some point or you know other relatives or friends um, and things of that nature. Uh, but yes, members of both families were enslavers. Were there diaries from any of these uh, women in particular? No. no oh, what a, what a lot, huh? Are any <laughs> of them buried? I mean, the Soliers left, but yes, are any of them um, don't So Bernard Soulier married his cousin, Eliza Corsell, who was um, also the, um, their, their mothers were sisters. And, um, and that sister also had a long-term interracial relationship, um, but uh, there's nothing written from her, nothing from their mothers. And it's, it's been, the Sule sisters are really a bit of a mystery um, because you know, they go off to, to Europe with the, with the other brothers and you don't really hear a whole lot about them. And so um, the great, great, great grandson of Bernard Soulier, Mr. also Norbert, after his great, great, great uncle, um, is um, found me by virtue of my dissertation uh, a couple of years after it was uh, uploaded to the University of Texas library system. And so we have um, been in touch over the ensuing years and are hoping to continue um, what we have been continuing research on the families um, and, and one of our goals is to really find the, the sisters of the families. Even in, um, I, you know, for a long time, the architecture, uh, the extant architecture of these builders, of these families, had, um, were really the only portraits that I have of them and, um, or had of them. Uh, but Mr. Soulier was able to provide me with, with portraits late in life of the Soulier brothers and Eliza Corsell, Bernard's wife, uh, but still, we don't have any photographs of the sisters 
which is quite interesting. Uh, so they remain a bit of a mystery aside from their real estate practices, but we're working on them. Do you know how the family was, I don't know if there are any records that show how the family was received? How were the free people of color received when they went to Europe? I think yeah. the, um, you know, circumstances could vary, but as far as the Soulier family, it seems like they were just integrated into uh, European society, into Parisian society. Uh, there does not seem to have been any conflict except in the case of, I can't remember whose son or grandson, but when he went to marry, there was some conflict and, um, and that marriage did not take place. Uh, and I'm not sure, I don't recall if it was uh, specifically because it was known that they were of um, African ancestry, uh, but there was uh, a bit of uh, a conflict there, but otherwise, they, there doesn't seem to have been any issue with, um, with them. Did the gentleman, that, the descendant that you, you met and kept in touch with, did he know, I mean, that his family was of mixed race? Yes. He did. Okay. So, because you wonder over the years, did it get lost, you know, because they intermarried with French people, I imagine. And it yes. just, um, so you wonder how the, the descendants, what they even knew about their mm -hmm. families. They did know, um, or he did know, and uh, had, had already started doing research on the family. And so we were able to combine um, our efforts and are continuing to do so. So sometime down the road, um, not immediately, <laughs> there are a few boxes to tick off, but we're hoping that there can be a, maybe a, a CEA family book. So. That would be exciting. Book number two, right? Yes. That'll probably be your book number two, maybe four. I have a couple of other projects brewing. I'm currently working on a biography of African-American architect John Saunders Chase, who was among the first African-Americans to enroll at the University of Texas, the first in the School of Architecture, uh, the first Black man to be licensed in the state of Texas, um, and really important figure in um, American architectural history. Uh, and in a similar, um, you know, a lot of the methodology that I engaged in as part of this book, this work, um, I've been doing to research African-American architects in Texas and specifically Austin. Um, and by virtue of a lot of different projects, it, it makes sense to tell a broader story about um, Black builders in Austin. And so that's another project that's kind of brewing in my brain. Oh, that sounds exciting. What year was he admitted to um 1950 1950 wow um we look forward to that one i there's so many questions and i wish we had time to continue to answer them and people who have specific questions about specific families mm -hmm. you might want to email I'm, I'm gonna say this tara i hope you're yes, okay with no that. please Absolutely. <laughs> you might want to e email dr dudley directly with your question because we couldn't get to all of them and i apologize for that um but i know she might be open to sharing some of her research if she has any on this. Oh, absolutely. I don't um, want to put words in your mouth. to have stories and, you know, at some point, in, you know, I'd like to come and, you know, if there are descendants or, you know, people who own homes um, that any of these individuals go to, to talk to you and conduct interviews on, because the, the more we know, uh, you know, we're really able to help enrich these stories and repopulate American architectural history with uh, with these individuals, and also, you know, I mean, from the canon to our you know lists of, of works and identifying these properties, and it's just amazing. Even in looking, and you know, the the French Quarter is a, a fairly small area, all things considered, and just to think about the numbers of properties at some point over the antebellum area era, even if it was just for a month. I mean, because sometimes people would buy a property and then they'd sell it but how many of those properties went through the hands of a free person of color uh, is, is quite amazing. Well, it's also just really telling because it was very different than anywhere on the South. We didn't have this really anywhere else. And so Louisiana was different. New Orleans was different. We always, we still are. <laughs> we still are. <laughs> but it's fascinating research. Um, thank you so much for sharing You're this with so us You're so welcome. I thank everyone for joining me and, and please, if you had a question that was not answered, don't hesitate to send me an email. And we have copies of Dr. Dudley's book and the PRC's online um, bookstore, prcno.org backslash shop. 
So please come and get it. Um, and it is fascinating. And I picked up one myself and have just started reading it. And really, truly, if you love New Orleans history and architectural history, this is one not to miss. So thank you again. Thank you. And thanks Good to everybody everyone. who tuned in.